All right. I love that song because it speaks so much of the truth of what we've been looking at the last several weeks. Um, the name of Jesus has more power than we can ever honestly imagine. The name of Jesus cannot be overcome by darkness. The name of Jesus can overcome all darkness, all evil, all wickedness. It can overcome those things. When we truly tap into God's power, which we get to through the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus into our lives, when we tap into that, and I mean, the Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, Satan himself, the ruler of this earth, who has dominion over almost everything on here, he has dominion over everything except for God's people. And at the name of Jesus, Satan must flee when a true believer says, in the name of Jesus. There's more power in that short little phrase than there is in anything this world can offer. In the name of Jesus. That's why, in the name of Jesus, you know, dead people were brought back to life. In the name of Jesus, people were healed from sicknesses that nothing on this earth could take care of. In the name of Jesus, you know, people were given, blind people were given sight, deaf people could hear. In the name of Jesus, again, dead people came back to life. In the name of Jesus. And so sometimes, let's be honest, man, life is in such a place where we have no words, we have no clue what to honestly say other than to cry out and just simply say, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We don't even know what to say to Jesus, but we just have to say Jesus because at that name, we get power. At that name, we start to have a hope and a meaning and a purpose. But it's through that name and it's through that name alone. Uh, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, so I just love that song. I love the fact that it, that it just says, man, through Jesus... There's nothing in this world that we cannot overcome. Through Jesus, there's nothing in this world that it can overpower and have victory over us. It's only through the name of Jesus that happens. Okay? So we're looking at this, um, this series. We, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up next week probably. So uh, we're getting real, real close here. But we're talking about what happens when we give our life to Jesus. We talk about all the, do the things that that change in our life. And some of them change immediately. Some of them change months down the line. Some change years down the line. Um, some take a whole lifetime to really develop. But these are the things that really happen when we give our life over to Jesus. Number one, we talked about you get a brand new life. Okay, You have an old life before Jesus where you were destined for hell to live in your own sin. You accept Jesus and now you have forgiveness of all those things you've ever done wrong. You have that new life. A new path. You have a new destination of heaven when we give your life to Jesus. We have a brand new life. And we talked about the power, the new power that we have. That's the Holy Spirit that comes to live with inside of you. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead after he had been dead for three days. That's power. Okay? We have that power. We have access to that power. Um, that power that's going to lead us and help us make right decisions. We have access to that now where we didn't have it before. We talked about our guide, the Bible, um, God's Word, His instruction booklet to us. We have access to that. Where we always voice had access to it, but now we have access to, to a, a way that we can really understand it. Uh, so we got to be getting into the Word of God and reading it to help us out. Then we have the new privilege of actually praying to God. Through Jesus, we don't have to go to um, a priest or a pastor and ask them to pray on our behalf like they did before Jesus. They would have to go to the tabernacle, and they would have to offer their sacrifice, and they have to go to somebody and say, okay, would you please pray for me? We don't have to do that anymore. Um, the temple uh, curtain was torn. We have direct access to God himself through prayer. So we need to utilize that. Then we talked about the hope that we have. The hope that we have in this life and the life to come. Through Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins. We have a hope of eternal life in heaven. We know that this life is so super, super temporary. It's super short. Even if we live to be 100 years old, which doesn't happen very often, okay, even if we live to be 100 years old, that's still a drop in the bucket of all of eternity. We're going to be alive for all of eternity in one way, shape, or form. It's either 
in hell, absence of everything good, or in heaven where everything is good. We have the hope through Jesus Christ that we have the inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and that's heaven. Our forgiveness can never be taken away from us. Our salvation can never be taken away from us. That's the hope that we have through Jesus. We talked about relationships, um, new relationships with all kinds of people. Um, we talked about how relationships are going to change. Some are going to fade away. Some are just going to get really, really strong and really, really close because of the relationship we now have with Jesus. All right. And then we talked about our new family, the church, the global family of God. And we talked about what we need to do. Um, Acts, 40, Acts 2.42, the, um, the people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the word of God, to fellowship, to sharing your meals, and to prayer. And when they devoted themselves to those four things, God added new followers of Jesus every single day. Um, and we talked about how we haven't devoted ourselves to these four things, and that's why many churches are closing. But when we devote ourselves to these four things, truly devote ourselves to these four things, um, God will do amazing things, and God will add people into the fold every single day. And then last week we looked at the Lord's Supper. Um, but God's actually partaking it. It's the reminder, the reminder what Jesus went through, of how his body was not just, he wasn't just arrested, and he wasn't just tried. I mean, he was, he was arrested, he was beaten, he was flogged, he was whipped, literally to within an inch of his life. They, they knew exactly when to stop so he wouldn't die. They knew if they went one more whip of that chain that had teeth and glass and stone in it, and they went one more, he would die. They knew when to stop so he wouldn't die. He'd barely be able to make it. He suffered all of that. And then to be nailed to a cross, to suffocate on that cross and die for you and me. Um, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's, it's to remind us of what Jesus went through, how his body was literally broken apart and his blood was shed for you and for me so we could have forgiveness of our sin. We could have a relationship with him, with, with God, and we could spend eternity in heaven with God. That's a reminder. It's not just to be a little snack every now and then that we get at church, um, a little itty-bitty tiny snack. It's a reminder what Jesus went through um, and how honored we should be and what he did for us and how he gave everything for us what are we willing to give back to him um, well, unfortunately oftentimes it's not enough we need to give more okay right, so tonight we're going to look real quick at a new opportunity that we have okay we're going to look at what it actually means to tie okay and i know you most of the guys most of the time i teach on tithing when it comes to teenagers they're like well, I don't work, I don't have a job, or what am I going to do that's actually going to be able to be anything worthwhile, okay? So we're gonna, it's not going to take very long, we're going to get this pretty quickly, so bear with me. But first off, you have to define what tithing is, okay? That actually kind of went out of order, my bad. Um, tithing is, is defined a couple different ways, depending upon where you look for that definition. Some... Some places define a tithe as 10% of your total income. Um, it's a gift that you're giving, but it's 10%. Okay? God's given you whatever it may be, so you can give him one-tenth of that. Okay? One-tenth doesn't seem like a whole lot until you have bills to pay. Trust me. And then one-tenth seems like a huge amount. Okay? That's why it's so important that you guys start looking for ways to start tithing, even as teenagers. So that when you start getting older and you have larger paychecks and you have larger things going on in your life, um, it's already a part of your life. And it's not something that you even think about. Okay, But it's 10% of income. It's one-tenth part of something. This is really kind of more what we're going to focus on. One-tenth part of something pays a contribution to a religious organization or compulsory tax to the government today. Today, ties are normally voluntary paid in cash or checks, or more recently via online giving, whereas historically, and this is kind of where for teenagers it can come into play, historically tithes were required and paid in kind, such as agricultural produce. So in Bible times, in Bible times, if you were, many guys, many people had their own farm of some kind, whether it was animals, 
or whether it was, you know, fruits and vegetables or whether it was spices, people had people always had something that they did um, on their own at their house. They always had something. Sometimes they would sell those things and they would make money off of it and they would tie it off of that. Sometimes they would literally bring those things to the church. Sometimes it was animals, right? Lots of sheep and goats and cows and rams and things like that. They had they had those when when ten of them would be born, they would grab the best one and they would bring it to church and they would give it to the people of the church who would use it for whatever the church felt like. If they grew produce, okay, they would grab these bushels and every tenth bushel they got, they would take one to the church and they would give it away. So use this to feed hungry people with. Use this to feed the priests with. You know, whatever it could be. When they had spices, same thing. They would gather all these together and then they'd take a tenth of that and they would take it to the church and that would be their offering. So it's not always a money thing. And this is where it comes in for teenagers especially because not many of you have a job and if you do have a job, you're not able to work a lot. So your paychecks are usually pretty rinky dinky if you even have one, right? Um, but you do have resources. You have time. You have energy. You have your own stuff okay that's all stuff that god has chosen to give to you and a tithe is something that you just give back to god saying thank you for what you've given to me okay um so another part about it um it's supporting the needs of pastors and the work of the local church is one of the main purposes of tithing so tithing helps your local church okay me okay actively be the church by helping others so giving encourage, it also encourages a grateful, generous spirit can help steer us away from being greedy or loving money too much. Guys, if you don't know it, the only way I get paid is when your families give tithes to the church. If you don't give money to the church, I don't get paid, I don't have a job. Okay? It's really sad to say, especially in the last couple of years, I have more, had more than one friend of mine who has been a youth pastor or associate pastor, whatever it is, who had to leave his church because of the whole corona thing going on. Because people stopped going to church and started watching online. They said, well, I'm just watching online, so I don't need to give my tithe to the church. And because they don't give their money to the church that way, the church financi suffers financially. We've had people lose their job that way. Okay. Tithing is what keeps the lights on in this building. Tithing is what allows us to go out and to feed hungry people um, and to minister to people out in the community um, who, who are on literally on their last hope. We have people who can't afford to pay their electric bill or water bill um, or pay their rent for the month, whatever it is. Um, your tithes, some of those are set aside to help out with those types of things. Um, some of it pays for all the, the pens and the paper and, and the, the clipboards you have in front of your hand, you're holding on to. Your tithes come in so we can do those types of things, okay? The, the food that you ate tonight, okay, was paid for by your tithes, your, your family's tithes, things like that. That's how the church operates. If people don't give, we don't have the church building, okay? So it's super, super important. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's how the church functions. So tithing is important, and the sooner that you can learn to figure out, okay, how can I give back to God a portion of what he's given to me? The sooner it will set you up to be able to do that for the rest of your life. Because you don't want to wait until you graduate college, you get that first job, you get that nice first big paycheck, which probably isn't going to be that big anyway. Um, you don't want to wait till then and go, okay, what's 10%? I'm going to write that check and go, oh, wait a minute, if I write this check, I can't pay my rent for the month. If I write this check, I don't get to go grocery shopping. And that's some of the hardest things. It's to be able to say, okay, God, I know as a Christian I'm supposed to tithe. But if I don't do this right now, um, some part of my life is going to be extremely difficult. And it's really, really hard to go ahead and say, okay, God, I'm still going to go ahead and I'm going to write this check out. Even though I know something is going to go unpaid. I'm trusting in you to provide for that. Um, and it's very, very hard. Uh, a lot of people don't do it. If, if every church member gave the 10% that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to give, churches would, I mean, we'd be, they'd be flourishing. We'd be reaching out to so many people. They're, they're probably, we could almost probably end world hunger. Let's just put it that way. Okay? 
be if everybody gave to the church the way they're supposed to give to the church. Can you imagine that? Okay? Poverty being gone. But because there's so many people who say, you know what, this is just something they want us to do. No, tithing is a commandment. Many times in the scripture it's mentioned. It's a commandment that we're supposed to give back to God a little bit of what he gave to us. So how do we really do that? Let's first start with why. Why should a believer, a Christian, tithe? Why? This is the parts of your notes. Why do we do this? Because, number one, the nature of God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. God gave Jesus to us. He left heaven, the perfect place. He left it, came to earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for you and me. It's, it's God's nature, Jesus' nature to give. He's given so much to us, the least that we can do is give a little bit back to him. Okay? It's the nature of God. So we're supposed to follow that. For God so loved the world, he gave his one only son, and everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Okay? He gave his one only son. He could have said, eh, you all figure it out on your own. Or, you know what, you guys just keep sacrificing bulls and rams and sheep and birds and all that kind of stuff. You try to get your way here. Because he knows we would have failed. He knows we would have failed. So he gave his son. So out of that, we give back. Okay? Number two, it's because each person has received so much. Guys, we are so blessed. Okay? We are so blessed. Even in America, you can be the poorest of the poorest of the poor in America, and you still have more money in your family's name than 80% of the rest of the world. Okay? Extreme poverty. There's level. I don't care if you know this, but there's there's multi levels of poverty even in America. There's multiple levels of that. There's just kind of your basic. Hey, this is the poverty level that we that we think you should make for a family. And then there's poverty below that. And then there's extreme poverty that's below that. And even extreme poverty in America, you still make more money than 80 to 90 percent of the rest of the world does. Okay, we are blessed. We're extremely blessed. Um, because we received, we give back. Um, you can read that if you really, really want to, or write down there. But we're going to move on. Um, 2 Corinthians 8, 7 is a scripture reference. You can look it up and read that for yourself. But God has been gracious to us, so we need to be gracious back. That's basically what we're saying. Okay, we received so much, we need to give back. Why else do we give? Because we need a regular reminder that all of our life's possessions do not belong to us. They belong to God. Okay, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. You belong to God. Everything that you have, that you own, belongs to God anyway. He's just allowing you to have, <laughs> to have a short possession of it. So if it's his anyway, it shouldn't be that big a reveal to give some of it back to him. Okay? It's a reminder that all of our possessions belong to God. The Bible says we should. Okay, Those are, there's three verses up there that talk about, hey, th these are commandments, guys. These are not suggestions. These are not if you feel like it or if you have money left over. These are commandments from God that we're supposed to give back to the church. We're supposed to help provide for the people who work in the church. Whatever church you are a member of, you are supposed to give to. Okay? You are supposed to give to. Okay? And then last week, Sam Brief talked about a little bit earlier, this is God's plan to finance the work of the church. If, it, if people don't give, the church doesn't operate. Okay? There's a lot of people that think the church is just all about, hey, you give, 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 and then you know, we're just going to take, 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 and take. You know, most churches, guys, they rarely have money sitting around. Because you know what? We get it in, we find a need for it, and we give it out. Okay? Um, it's not like we sit here and stockpile. If you ever see a pastor, um, that's why some, man, some of the evangelists that are out there, these guys that have you know, million dollar houses, and some of them multi, they have multiple houses worth millions of dollars, okay? They are not in this for the right reason. Because a true pastor is just a shepherd of a flock, which means we're looking out for the other people. If there is a need, I'm sharing with that person who has a need. If there's something going on where they're, they're struggling, I'm taking the resources of the church to help them not struggle. Okay? That's what a pastor does. That's what a church employee does. All right? That's how we finance the work of the church is by your giving. And sometimes, guys, that is your money. So if you get a paycheck from whatever work you may do, even if it's cash, you are to give a little bit back to God. Okay? 
But if you don't have something where you receive income, the biggest thing that we can do is we can give back God some of our time. Okay? That means we're coming to Sunday school, we're coming to worship service, we're coming to youth group, we're, we're going on summer camp, mission trips. Um, we are, um, you know, next, next month we have a trunk or treat. We're here not to just run around and collect candy and play the games. No, we're here to serve the community. Right? We're being an active part of the church. We're giving of our time, our energy, to help further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, it's part of God's plan. So who should tithe? 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Okay? You must each divide in your heart how much to give. Decide, it's supposed to be decide and divide. Decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly in response to pressure, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. You must each. So who is included in each of you? Okay. Does that does that include is that does that does that exclude anybody? No. Is there anybody who is exempt from that? No. Okay. no, it says each of you. So that means every single person is responsible to decide in your heart how much to give. How much, when, where, how. Each person. Okay? When do we tithe? 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Again, that word each. It doesn't just say the grown-ups. It doesn't just say people who have a whole lot of money. Right? It says each of you. On the first day of the week, each of you should put aside a portion of the money that you have earned. Now again, if you don't have a job, then you don't have money coming in. That's really okay. But that doesn't mean you have just a free pass. Hey, I don't have to do anything. You still need to find a way to really give back to God a portion of what he has given to you. Um, all right, my wife died. I have no idea what time it is. Who's got, who's got a watch? Seven eighteen. Okay. Okay. So, who should tithe? Every one of us should tithe. When do we tithe? We tithe. And guys, listen. I mean, so some people, some people don't get paid every single week. I don't get paid every single week. I get paid every other week. But you know what that means? As soon as I get paid. First thing I do before I sit down and I pay, you know, my house and my cars and my electric and all that stuff. The very first thing I do is the first check that I write as a church. That's showing God that he is more important to me than my house and my cars and everything else that I've got to do. I give it to him first. Right? When I don't get a check, I don't put a tithe in because I haven't gotten anything that week. It's really okay. It's, but it's like every time that you receive something, whether it's cash or it's a check or it's, you know, maybe somebody just blessed you with something out of the blue, and it's food. Okay, well, how can I turn around and bless somebody else? I've been given a whole lot, and you have been. What can I do to help somebody else out? What can I do to do something at my church? That allows the church to reach out to somebody in need. Okay, we all have been given a lot, um, and we're supposed to give back a little bit of that. So I know tithing is one of the things it's it's rarely ever talked about when it comes to teenagers because most of the time um, it doesn't. People don't think it really applies, but you know what? It does apply to you because you are just as much a member of this church as. You know, so and so a couple that's been married for 50 years has been a part of this church for the last 50 or 60 years. You're just as much of a member as they are. You're just as important to the outreach of this church as they are. Just because you're a teenager and you don't have a full time job doesn't make you any less worthy, doesn't make you any less important. We're all part of this body of Christ and we all have a responsibility. We all have a role to play. We all have. Something that we're supposed to be doing here. Okay? And this can be completely... <laughs> this can be completely awkward. This can be completely... I mean, it can be kind of scary. But, here's my challenge to you guys. When you get home and your parents ask you what you talked about. Well, we talked about tithing. Mom, Dad... 
Do we give to the church as a family? Do we give? Do you support the church? Do you help out? Well, you know what? Money's really, really tight right now. Okay, I get that. How can we fix that? But what can we do maybe to serve in the meantime? What can we do to give of our time and our energy to bless the church so that maybe the pastors uh, or the secretary or somebody in the church, their, their, their load is lightened a little bit? I don't know if you guys know it or not, but, you know, pastors, sometimes we, we can work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Uh, and it doesn't seem like because we're not here at this church, but we're out somewhere. We're spending time away from our families. We're spending our gas money. We're spending our energy to go and to minister to someone. And some of the best things that you can do is just go to a pastor and say, what can I do that's going to that's gonna take an hour off of, off of your schedule for the week? What can I do that, that, that maybe you've got to do something, but I can do it for you? What do you have going on that I can do, that I can be a part of? Or maybe it's just, hey, can I go with you on something? Just so you're not by yourself. Um, you know, can my family buy you lunch, buy you dinner? Um, because you're going to be away from your family and you're going to still need something to eat because you're out ministering to a group of people. Um, you know, there, there's always something that you can do to lighten the load of somebody who's got a lot on their plate. And right now, one of the best things, guys, that you can do is, is, is pray. Everybody can pray. Um, if you're not praying for Sean and Kyle and me on a daily basis, um, please start. We need your prayers. Because as much as you feel like your life might be under attack, mm -hmm. our life is under attack a thousand times more than yours is. Because we're the ones that are in front of you all the time. Because we're the ones who are responsible for leading you in the right direction. And so as much as you think Satan comes after you, he comes after us harder. Because if he knows if he can knock me off of God's path, then he can knock every single one of you off because you're going to follow me. He knows if he can knock Sean just a little bit off the path that God has chosen for him, then there's 200 people that are going to follow Sean on the wrong path. So he comes after us even harder. So one of the easiest, most important things that you can do is to just pray for us. That we would know what God wants us to do. We would do what God wants us to do. And that we would have the strength and the courage to do what God wants us to do. Because sometimes it's standing up in front of a group of people and talking about something that they really don't want to hear about, like tithing. Um, sometimes it's going to somebody's house at 9 or 10 o'clock at night who's dealing with the loss of a loved one, who's dealing with the loss of a job, who's dealing with um, so much stress that, you know, that... <laughs> They're really about to end up in the hospital because they just can't handle it anymore, physically, mentally, emotionally. Now, sometimes it's just being with those people. And it's really, really hard. But it's a calling. And it's something that we take great joy and pride in. Um, so even if you can't give financially, you can give your time, you can give your energy, and you can definitely pray. You can definitely pray for us. We definitely, definitely need that. Um, so, what do you have in your life that you can be giving to support this church? What do you have that you can be using to help us reach out to the community and see people get saved? You've got something. Maybe it is just literally your talents and your abilities. But God's given those to you to use for Him, to use for the church, not to use for yourself. Um, so how can you use that? To help this church reach out to more people. Again, our next big thing coming up is the trunk retreat. It's at the end of October. You know, how can you be involved in that? You can, you can be here and simply just serve hot dogs and smile at people and say, "Hey, how you doing?" You can be here, um, you know, with with, with a with a car with your family and, and play games with little kids um, and just make sure that you're loving on them in Jesus' name. Um, you know, maybe you want to be part of the cleanup crew. Maybe you want to. You know, um, I don't know. There's going to be all kinds of different ways that you can that you can be out here. And you can serve. Um, the problem is, people go. Oh, you know what? Somebody else will do it. The problem is, when everybody says somebody else will do it, nobody does it. 
God's calling you to serve. God's calling you to give. Just do what he wants you to do. Listen. And ask him and then listen and then do what he's telling you to do. All right. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Um, I know we're, we're done a little early. I know it's still going on in there. So um, make sure you hang out in here. Um, or if you if your ride's here and you got to go, that's fine. Uh, but I know choir practice is still going on. Um, so feel free to hang out in here until... Um, they they get finished, but let's not go that direction so we don't interrupt choir practice. All right, let's pray real quick, and then um, we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for each one of these kids who are here today. Um, the adults are in this room. Um, Lord God, I know tithing is one of those things that we really honestly don't like to talk about because we don't want to give up our money. We don't want to give up our stuff. We don't want to give up our time and our energy. We don't want to give those things away, but God, you've commanded us to do these things. So if we don't, we're sinning. We're, we're, we're not following you. We're not obeying you. So God, I pray that you would show each and every single one of us exactly what we need to do to be obedient to you. If we don't have a steady paycheck, if we don't have a paycheck at all, God, how can we give to you? How can we give to this church? Um, well, just, just reveal your will to each one of us for, the, for that area that, that we desperately need to be obeying you. Um, God, as we go from here, I pray that you get everybody home safely. I pray that for a great night's sleep. And God, that we can finish this week strong. And I pray, Father, that you would bring us back here on Sunday for Sunday school, for worship. I'm just ready to encounter you uh, again. Father, we lift up to you right now, uh, Florida, um, all those towns, all those people. Um, God, my friends, the Osbournes. Um, uh, I know I know there's more. Going, there's more. Um, some of my friends who are in the path of the storm, Father God, I pray that you would just have the storm to die down very quickly. I pray, Father God, for safety and protection of people. And I thank you so much for all those people, those, those linemen who are on standby right now waiting for the first chance to be able to get in to start working on cleaning up um, and restoring power. Um, I pray, God, that you would keep them safe as they do that. And, and Lord, that it would move, it would move the, the, the cleanup would, would happen quickly. Um, people be able to get back to their homes, back to their um, daily routine, routine as quick as possible. Um, and Lord God, that you would limit the damage um, of this hurricane that's going through. Uh, Father God, I pray for anybody in this room right now who just doesn't know you as their Lord, as their Savior. I pray that you would make it known to them, God, that you would reach out to them, that, that they would know they need to give their life over to you, that they would not wait. They would make sure that, the, that today is the day that they know they have salvation through Jesus. Um, God, may all we say and do give you glory and honor because you alone are worthy. Right now, everybody's heads bowed, everybody's eyes are closed. I'm the only one right now looking around. I have any adults, it's just me. Um, I got to ask tonight, um, maybe none of this makes any sense to you because you've never given your life to Jesus. Um, you've never said, you know, I, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow him the rest of my days. I'm not going to follow him. My goals, my dreams, I'm going to follow Jesus. You've never given your life to Jesus. If you haven't done that, I'm just perfectly honest. If you don't make it home tonight, which is a possibility, we don't like to think about it, but it's a possibility. Um, you know, your eternal home is hell, and it's a place that you don't want to be. It's the absence of God and anything good. You're, you're isolated all by yourself. Nobody around, nobody to talk to. Everything hurts. It's just pain and agony, and you can't get away from it. How would you want to be a part of that? Nobody would ever want to be a part of that. Not even the worst person in the world would ever want to be a part of that. Um, but heaven is where God is. It's where everything is good. Everything is perfect. Everything is pure. And it's as simple as just giving your life to Jesus. And that can be your eternal home. So, again, nobody's looking around. It's literally just me. If you've never given your life to Jesus, and God's telling you, yeah, man, I want to come in. I want to be a part of your life. Let me help you. Let me... Let me, let, me, let me save you. All you got to do is just look up, make eye contact with me and say, yeah, you know what? I, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And I will lead you in that simple prayer. And you can know tonight that if you die, you're going to go face Jesus and you're going to have eternal home in heaven. So is anybody here tonight say, you know what? I, I'm ready to make that decision. I'm ready to follow God. I'm ready to put my faith and trust into him. All right, all I'm going to simply do is I'm just going to say a prayer. Uh, maybe you, you didn't have quite the courage to look up at me, but you know you've never given your life to Jesus. Um, and you, you want to. All you got to do is say this prayer with me. Um, and then when we're done, make sure you tell Mary or Mark or myself that you said this prayer for the first time tonight. 
because we want to rejoice with you. Um, if you need to give your life to Jesus, just simply say something. It doesn't have to be word for word, just something like this. Just simply say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me, a sinner. I know I messed up. I know I do wrong things. But you still love me. And I cannot thank you enough for that. So Jesus, tonight, I'm putting my faith, my trust in you and in you alone. I'm giving my life to you right now. Come into my life and take over. Mold me, shape me according to your will for me. I'm confessing you as my Lord and as my Savior right now. Help me to follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there's that in. In Jesus' name. That's why we say that. We say in Jesus' name because we know there's power. We know there's hope. We know Satan can't do anything to stop us when we're doing it in Jesus' name and Jesus' power. All right, so thanks so much for being here. Again, if you said that prayer for the first time tonight, make sure you tell one of us adults just so we can rejoice with you. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Um, we praying for Pastor Sean. He's got something going on with his throat, um, and it hurts. Um, he's getting... He's gotten tests yesterday, he got tests today, and tests tomorrow and Saturday, just to try and find out exactly what's causing this. So be praying for him, that, that God would give him health and strength. Um, you know, but hope you have a great rest of your week, and I hope you will, I'll see you here Sunday morning for Sunday school. All right, and bring somebody with you. All right, have a great day, great rest of your week. Love you all.